The story of media is essentially a story about technology. The two are synonymous if you think about it. The word media is simply the plural for a medium. And a medium is just a tool or technology that conveys some sort of content to us. And so in a sense, the media as we think of it is really just the technology that delivers it to us. And so as technology changes, the media changes. And so we'll start our story today with the earliest of technologies, the very beginning of mass media, the medium of us, the town crier, right? This is how mass media essentially started. This poor guy shouting at the top of his lungs, sharing the news of the day. Lucky for his vocal cords, there was a huge game changer in the mid 1400s. You've probably guessed it. It was Gutenberg's printing press in 1440. The ability to mass distribute and uh, mass replicate print media not only changed the way we communicate, but whole industries emerged and collapsed around it. It even rewired the way we think and behave. Marshall McLuhan and others have done extensive research into how the, uh, how the medium affects us and changes us. Uh, and it may very well be that our entire capacity for syllogistic reasoning, uh, the idea that if A is this and B is that, A plus B then equals C. This idea of ordered, logical, progressive thinking is a direct result of prints ordered, logical, sequential way of giving us information, rewiring our brains to expect all things to function that way logically. This is what we call disruptive technology. Its existence not only disrupts our way of doing business as usual, but it also disrupts communications all the way down to trade, all the way down to commerce and culture and ideology. Everything it touches falls prey to it. In 1690, we see the first American paper. It was called Public Occurrences, Both Foreign and Domestic, with a quaint CK at the end of public and domestic. And in 1769, we see the first American-built printing press. Now, by the mid-1760s, there were 24 weekly newspapers in the 13 fledgling colonies. Unfortunately, New Jersey was the only one without it. Uh, the satirical attack of the government was actually a really big part of these papers and it became common practice. And this is important to note because we have to remember this is in the mid 1760s. Independence is declared in 1776, right? So this means that um, the way that the, the media interacts with the government would shape the way that our country would form and think about the media from that point forward. And it turned out governors uh, under the king would not really like this satire, so they would often shut down the press and sue for libel. And so it became top on our priority list as we became our own country and got out from under those governors that we add something to our constitution that protects the press. And so in 1791, we see the addition of the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press to our constitution. Now, as innovations develop, print media develops and we develop a culture of consuming print media. Now around 1800, the steam press is invented and the number of prints per hour possible sextuples going from 480 prints to about 2,400 prints. And as you see the rise, and as you see this, you get the rise of the newspaper barons and tycoons and all of that culture. But the culture of print media changes again in 1844 when we have a new technology come in and disrupt things a bit. And this is the telegraph. Uh, for the first time, we have an instantaneous way of communicating audio signals, as well as just print. Um, and then in 1845, this gets upped again to the rotary press. And in 1937, we start to have a burgeoning of 
media in terms of news media, mass media applications for this sound-based broadcast. And so in 1937, we have Edward R. Murrow move to London and become a radio broadcast superstar. He captures the minds of the people that listen to him. Um, but again, it was really only ever limited to 15 minute or uh, two five minute daily broadcasts where they're basically just reflecting on the local news. Um, it was essentially doing what print was already doing just in an audio format. And that's something that most technologies, most technologies do as they start. When they first come out, they're still figuring out what they are. And so they emulate the formats and the technologies that came before them. Well, Edward R. Murrow returns in 1944 and he's a star. And yet he is interrupted. He is disrupted by yet another ad advancement. In 1947, we have the first TV news broadcast. And their work consisted, lar consisted largely of unscripted interviews and uh, reading print stories and reflecting on these print stories. Again, following in the footsteps of print and radio, but this time on screen. All of this kept going until something earth-shaking happened that would change the way that these media thought of themselves. In 1963, Kennedy was assassinated. And for the first time, we saw the tragedy unfold in front of our eyes on live television. And it demonstrated how television could do something that no other medium before it could do. Print and radio couldn't quite convey the emotional gravitas of this moment the way that television could. And so we see this moment of uh, differentiation where television begins to say, I know what I'm good at and I don't have to be print and be radio. And it comes into its own and it differentiates itself from the other media. This is a sign of maturity of a medium. Now, print and audio and video pretty much continue to evolve and differentiate in their own ways uh, and just become bigger and better versions of themselves. And as we get these three distinguished technological realms, we start to see three distinguished categories for communications emerge. Mass media, telecommunications, and information technology all driven by these technologies. Mass media, of course, the printing press, right? One centralized body distributing out to the masses. Telecommunications, the technology of the phone on the back of the broadcast media, the audio media we had seen prior, um, the ability to communicate in a two-way fashion instantaneously. And information technology, from something as simple as the calculator all the way up through the modern computer, um, the ability to handle and process data at incredible speeds. And again, these things keep going on and becoming bigger, better, shinier, faster versions of themselves. Um, and looking at this calculator now, we can see that it's, uh, it's, we've gotten even bigger and better and shinier and faster since. But then the single most disruptive technology since the printing press comes along. The internet. The internet comes along and for the first time, we don't really know what to do with it. Is it mass media? Well, it can certainly distribute information to a large amount of people very easily. But is it telecommunications? I can email, I can IM, I can talk to people one-to-one, -one, real time. But it's also information technology, isn't it, right? We can calculate huge amounts of numbers uh, and, and catalog and store and process unfathomable amounts of data through the internet. And so, for the first time, we see something that doesn't play by the rules here. 
And all of these fields start to get muddied and converge into mass teleform media telecommunications or something like that. We still don't quite know what to make of this, but this is the heart of disruptive technology. Convergence. When media converge and the, the waters get muddied, then we have an interesting paradigm shift on our hands. astounding, right? Think of all of the disruption that was caused by this technological convergence. <clears throat> Think of all the calculators no one's using. Think of all the dictionaries no one's reading, thanks to this new technology. It turns out that at its heart, most disruptive technology is about convergence. Henry Jenkins has this theory, the myth of the black box, this ultimate Swiss army knife, technological Swiss army knife that uh, would be able to do everything for us. And really, technologically speaking, we have that in our pockets right now, most of us. Um, mobile technology is one of the most disruptive pieces of convergence that we've seen. Suddenly, in this one device, we have a way to read articles, but also write articles. We could watch videos, but there's a camera on here. We could make videos. We could listen to podcasts. We could voice record ourselves. Um, we can consume news in all of its forms. You can share news. You can plan dinner dates. You can connect with people. You could watch videos of people's cats and babies. You can catch Pokemon. There's nothing that this thing can't do, so it seems. And much the way that print did with the revolution of the Gutenberg press, these little black boxes are rewiring our brains as well. I mean, just think about all the time you uh, see people in the subway not interacting because of these things or walking through the streets with their heads down or thinking in terms of status updates. And you can see the future of, of convergence. Uh, computers are getting smaller, becoming tablets. Phones are getting bigger and becoming tablets. And tablets are getting smarter and more powerful and becoming what phones and computers used to do. In fact, you could see the writing on the wall if any of you were Apple users around 2012-ish. Um, during one of their operating system updates, Apple did something very clever. It was a small change, but if you notice, you used to scroll up by moving your fingers up, the two finger swipe. You would scroll up by moving your fingers up. Um, this seemed intuitive enough. Down, you'd go down. And then all of a sudden, in their update, they flipped it. And now, in order to scroll the page down, you would push your fingers up. And in order to scroll the page up, you would push your fingers down. And it seemed to make no sense until you consider touch screens. See, Apple saw that one day these things where we would literally pull the page down in order to see higher or push the page up in order to see lower would converge with the screens on our desktops that we're looking at. And they wanted to ease us into that transition so they wouldn't lose us in the uh, user interface um, ease, of, ease of use department. And the next step, who knows, the next step will probably be the convergence of cyberspace itself 
with the very body trying to access it. We've already seen signs of this with augmented reality and virtual reality. So moral of the story, we have this tool now that both contains inside of it all the tools we need for consuming media, but also all the tools we need for creating media. Now, one of the ways that this technological convergence has disrupted the universe is, of course, through its effect on media culture itself. The internet kind of continued on for a while doing its thing, following in the footsteps of its predecessors, just like every other new medium before it. Even into the turn of the 20th century, uh, 21st century, pardon me. In the year 2000, if you look at things like Craigslist, it's essentially just imitating old print classified ads. However, in 2004, we start to see a little bit of a shift with uh, news sites like dig.com, which actually crowdsourced what it thought was important in order to prioritize its news for you. Or 2005, Huffington Post um, blurs the lines between professional journalism, professional news, and opinion reporting, and user-generated content. And this user-generated content is the game changer, which moves us from this read-only static web to this richer, interactive, user-generated world of social media that we navigate now. Now, 2004 is when, of course, this all gets blown open when some people at Harvard decide that they want to create some user-generated interactive content of their own, and they go on to create what will be known as Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg and his compatriots uh, go live in 2000, go public, excuse me, in 2006, and the world is forever changed. Now, remember the Kennedy assassination's effect on TV, how it shaped TV into something totally new, where it realized its new potential, and it differentiated itself into the medium that it would become. Something like that happened for the internet in 2007 because of the social media world. Now, in 2007, the Virginia Tech shootings occurred. And for the first time, people actually found out about this, not through news organizations, but through Twitter. People were able to tweet the news as it was happening, and people found out about this throughout the country before news crews ever even arrived on campus. This was a major disruption to the journalism world, so much so that after this happened in 2008, the very next year, Madison Capital Times, which was a newspaper founded in 1917, this is like Newsies era, announced it would cease publication of its print newspaper and exist solely online. And we start to see the differentiation of the internet as a social medium. This breeds the divergence of authority. So convergence of technology, because all of these people have the ability in the palm of their hands to do anything, now suddenly anyone has the power to be an authority in something. This is a huge shift. Combine that with something like this fellow, Brie Pettis, who is the founder and CEO of MakerBot. MakerBot is one of the first user uh, um, mass market affordable um, personal 3D printers. And this is just indicative of this whole DIY do it yourself maker movement, which proved to us that we don't have to rely on corporate juggernauts or, uh, or um, the media tycoons of the past in order to distribute products or ideas. And so we see a, an eroding of brand loyalty. People begin to become distrustful of the machine and they start to value peer generated content as uh, somehow less biased or more reliable or more honest. And this changed the game for the communications paradigm. We shift now from the old guard, which is following a one-to-many model, to the new guard, which is a many-to-many -many model. From one-to-many 
to many to many. Now, the old way is the old media tycoon way, right? The one distributes his authority on the media to the masses, one to many. But now, every person who has one of these things can just as easily and just as professionally put out just as much information or more than that one. And every single person of those many now becomes a one in themselves. Consumers now become producers. And so with the convergence of technology breeding this divergence of authority, we get this shift from one to many to many to many. Consumers becoming producers. Why this matters is everyone now has an audience and everyone has the tools at their disposal to be a media tycoon. This means that everyone is now a professional journalist. This is where you come in. There's a new role and responsibility on all media producers. And now everybody is capable and responsible for all types of media. And that's why we need to figure out how to do it well.